startups is very typical of startups. The whole idea that um, that a few young people could invent something that will completely turn over that has nothing to do with what an entire industry is doing a completely different way, uh, um, and that somehow everybody will adopt this. And uh, you know what? Something very Israeli in this story is simply the, the kind of lack of respect for authority <coughs> is uh, very typical. Uh, the uh, tendency to debate, to argue, to challenge, which is a cultural thing that's very much uh, in line with startups generally. Uh, startups don't have a lot of hierarchy. Uh, they don't. Um, uh, they don't have a lot of uh, you know authority. Uh, they don't, uh, they're very informal and they're based on a lot of, you know, honest uh, discussion and argument. Um, and, but, you know, this story and others, we, we talk about many, a number of factors in the book about where all this comes from. Um, but before that, I think that there's a general lesson about the nature of innovation that comes from Israel and comes from the book. And that is that innovation is not what most people think it is. Because if you put the word innovation into Google Images, and you can try this, um, you'll get lots of pictures of light bulbs. Because that's what we think of. When we think of <coughs> innovation, we think of light bulbs, because light bulbs are the symbol of the idea. And we think innovation <coughs> is ideas. Um, but that doesn't seem to be so true, because if you look at the number of patents in the world, uh, Israel is very strong. We're number one in medical device patents in the world. Uh, but uh, <coughs> there are other countries that are ahead of Israel, even in per capita terms, in patents, or certainly in certain categories of patents. And there are a bunch of countries that are basically the same level as Israel. So evidently, there are lots of light bulbs going off. They get, they've got the ideas, but these same countries producing so many patents aren't producing anywhere near the number of startups as Israel is. So evidently, there's something besides ideas that produces startups. And we think that there's two big factors that come out from the Israeli story. One is you need a lot of drive and determination and mission orientation. Some say chutzpah. I mean, this kind of, there are a number of words for it. That's one thing. And the other thing you need is a willingness to take risks. Very important, because most startups fail, <coughs> including in Israel. The, the, the success rate of startups in Israel is not higher than it is in Silicon Valley. Um, so, you know, those of you uh, who have tried to be entrepreneurs or know about startups, know that anyone with a new idea, the first thing that will happen if you try to talk to people about a new idea is they'll tell you it's a bad idea. Because uh, <laughs> it's a new idea. You know, it sounds bad. Um, and the other thing they'll tell you is that if you're doing a startup, is don't do it because most startups fail. And that's mm -hmm. true. Uh, so you need a lot of determination and willingness to take risks to get through that. Um, and Israel gets those two, so then most of the book ends up being, where does Israel get those two things? And we think it <coughs> comes from partly the fact that Israel itself is a startup. I mean, it took a lot of drive and determination for Israel, the country, to be here in the first place. And not just 60 years ago, but even over the whole history, it's, it's been a constant struggle with all kinds of adversity, um, you know, the lack of a local market, the lack of a, a being shut off from the regional market, um, uh, no resources to speak of, uh, being under attack, being subject to all kinds of boycotts and so on. These various forms of adversity, Israel has essentially turned into a kind of renewable resource of creative energy. And, and one of the interesting things about Israel is that that creative energy doesn't just go into startups. It goes into social entrepreneurship. It goes to the arts and culture. So that's a whole <coughs> thing that we didn't really cover that much in the book that's very interesting to see when you're here. When you come back, you'll have to see more of that. Um, so uh, 
But there are other places where this comes from. Uh, one of them is the military, a big factor. Now, not though in the sense that most people think. When most people think of military and high tech, they think of either of two things. One, they, they think of military R&D that goes into civilian stuff. Uh, and that happens that, uh, that sometimes something developed in the military uh, becomes a, a startup. Uh, but that's not the main part of the story. Uh, most of the Israeli startups are not in the security area. I mean, there are a lot that are, but there are, most are not. Um, Israel is, very, as I mentioned, very strong in medical devices and, and uh, clean tech and, and uh, uh, biotech, all, all kinds of things that are not, not really related to military. Um, and the, the other thing people t think of when they think of the military is they think of particular units in the Israeli military that, that are high-tech oriented, and people get a lot of training in those units in a high-tech, and they, uh, and a lot of those people do end up going into high-tech. Uh, and that also happens, and we talk about that in the book, about those units. But we would say that the main thing is neither of these factors, but that the cultural impact of the military on Israeli, because most Israelis go through this. It's <coughs> become a third stage in life. Uh, between school on the one hand and work on the other. And it's a stage where Israelis, even if they're not in a high-tech unit, any kind of unit, uh, they learn about leadership, teamwork, about improvisation. Uh, and th that's a strange thing in the military. You think of, you know, discipline and all that. But um, in, in the Israeli military, actually, the main thing you learn is what a mission is all kinds of, of missions. Um, and what a mission is, is that it's something that you need to get done, that lives depend on it, and it doesn't matter if you have enough resources or you have enough time, you have to get it done. And the, and the fact that you have to get something done forces you to improvise. So it actually tends to make, to teach improvisation as well as what a mission is. And so Israelis come out of the military and then they go, Sometimes they go during or before uh, the military, they go to school. More often they go to school after the military. And they're, they are in a different place when they get to school. They tend to be more mature. Uh, and I think they get more out of the university experience, because partly because they're older, partly because uh, they're in more of a hurry because they spend all this time in the army and, and uh, they want to get going with their lives. And so. What we found when we talked to all these high-tech people in other countries and we asked them about Israel, uh, one of the things they kept saying about young Israelis who are about 27, 28 year old, old uh, who have been to the military and university, uh, that there's something about them that, that's different. They're, they're, they're maybe more mature, they're uh, more driven, uh, things like that. And uh, we think that's <coughs> very, very important for startups. Um, Another big, big factor is the fact that Israel is a country of immigrants. Immigrants, because they decided to move from one place to another, they're naturally, uh, they were driven to do that. There's, there must be driven people. And their willingness, they're willing to take risks. They took a big risk to move from one country to another. So in Israel, everybody almost uh, themselves is an immigrant or their parents or their grandparents. So it's a very, it's a, it's a country with an immigrant atmosphere. We have people here from 70, 80 countries, different cultures. I think that also adds to the creativity. It's a very multicultural country. Um, so a big question here, though, is how important is all this? Because <coughs> when you think of startups, you think of very small companies that uh, you know, have new technology. They're cute, but how, how, how important are they really? And Israel's had a, a really big impact on the world of technology, I think, not just through startups, but through very big companies. Because if you look um, at mostly American companies, that the, the uh, who's who of, of big companies is here. In, Intel, Microsoft, Google, Cisco, IBM, you name it, they're, they're here in a very big way. They either have bought lots of companies or they've started a research and development center, or both, they end up being about the same thing. Uh, because, you know, for example, the fraud sciences story. Um, 
Scott Thompson told us that, that fraud sciences, you know, they bought it for a particular technology. But after that, whenever they had a tough problem in, in PayPal, they would, you know, that they need a real creative solution, they sent it to their Israeli team because the Israeli team essentially became their R&D center. <coughs> and that's happened with a lot of companies here, uh, a lot of big companies outside of Israel. They bought Israeli startups and that's become their R&D center. Um, and this, I think the reason this has happened so strongly between, mainly between the United States and Israel, is that there's a natural synergy between big companies and, and startups. Uh, you know, the head of um, General Electric was just here, Jeff Immelt, and he said, um, he basically, his message to the audience was, you know, you guys are great at innovation, we're great at scaling up. So you bring us your innovations and we'll scale them up. And this is, I mean, this is very simply put, the natural partnership between startups and big companies. Because, you know, Israel's good at startups, but <coughs> we're lousy at, at building big companies. We don't know how to do marketing, how to do sales, how to do management. All these things that happen once you've done the startup, once you go from, say, zero to $100 million, and then you're looking at how do you get to a billion dollar company. And that's the part that Israelis are not so good at. And some people think it's it's just because they're greedy, they want a quick exit, you know, they're, they're, they're offered to, you know, millions of dollars and they can't turn it down. I don't think it's so simple. You know, that's, sometimes that, that happens, sometimes the investors are pushing to, to take, the, take the money, sometimes the entrepreneur wants to take the money, but I think the more common thing is if you're an entrepreneur and you've just done this startup and then suddenly you're into all these things like you have to deal with marketing and management and sales and it's a very different animal than it is when you're just starting up and many entrepreneurs don't like that they they don't they don't want to go through the process of building something they'd rather start something new uh, so it's not just about money, it's about the nature of entrepreneurs, and it's the fact that startups and big companies are very different beasts. And, but it turns out there's this great need. Both of, each is good at something the other doesn't know how to do. Just like startups don't know how to scale things up, big companies don't know how to do disruptive innovation. It's very hard to do major innovation in a big company because You've got all these products, and, and basically you tend to just tweak what you've got. You know, you've got something that works, so you try to make it a little better. That's not what goes on in startups. Uh, you know, the Apple is, is the exception, but you know, most, com most big companies are really not able to do huge new developments. And uh, so the, these American companies have basically been coming to Israel to do that, to help them do that. Um, now the mystery is, and actually Dan is the one who taught me for this, um, uh, he has a slide in his presentation that shows that the, I think it's about 80% uh, of the foreign direct investment in Israel, which is basically the R&D centers, um, is from the United States. And that doesn't make a lot of sense. Where is the rest of the world? 20% for all of Asia, Europe, you know, South America, and so on. Uh, where are the counterparts of all of these American companies? Uh, um, and also, I think there are a lot of American companies that are not in Israel that should be. For instance, Procter & Gamble is here, you know, a big consumer company. Johnson & Johnson, I mean, they're doing healthcare, but uh, they're doing tech, but uh, they're, they're there are companies here uh, that you wouldn't normally think of um, because, why are they here? Because hey, Procter Gamble is very serious about innovation, about open innovation. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be international about your R&D or about your innovation, you got to be in Israel. I mean, and some of these companies like Intel and Microsoft, Israel was the first place where they did anything outside of the United States. But certainly, <coughs> You know, these companies that have a development center in Germany or Beijing and whatever, uh, they, they really should have one in, in Israel. Um, I, I understand companies who aren't thinking globally, who aren't thinking outside of their own company in terms of R&D. Okay, it's hard to think of going to another country. But the ones who already are, 
really should be here. I mean, I was, I was recently speaking in, in Berlin in a conference uh, with the head of Deutsche Telekom, and Deutsche Telekom is here, Siemens is here, uh, 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 France Telecom is, is here, I think. Um, uh, but, but, you know, there, I'm sure there are lots more European com companies that could do a lot more work here. And um, I actually have a crazy new idea about uh, not just big companies and startups, but that Israel should become the Silicon Valley of the rest of the world. Meaning that instead of going to Silicon Valley to do startups, which a lot of Israelis do actually, uh, you know, people from India, from Korea, from Brazil, from places like this should come to Israel to do startups together with Israeli startups. I think that could be really great. Um, and I'll just end up with a, a, a thought also about another big area of impact, uh, and that is a kind of a crazy thing, which is that a tiny country like Israel is actually trying to solve global problems. And, and the best example of this is a company called Better Place um, <laughs> that uh, you probably run into. Um, that is building infrastructure to allow electric cars to work. And Israel is going to be the first country in the world to get off oil this year. We're not just going to have, you know, hybrid cars that cost more and go 20% green. I'm talking about cars that are competitive with gas cars in every level, price, convenience, whatever, and are 100% green, no tailpipe. Um, so this is in Israel, we're actually going to replace the gas car uh, starting this year. I'm going to be able to buy one and drive it anywhere in the country. This is <coughs> happening uh, first here and, and almost at the same time in Denmark. And uh, next it's going to happen in Australia, which is going to show that it's not just small countries. There's no reason why this can't be uh, for any size country. In fact, the Chinese are very, very serious about going in this direction. They won't necessarily do it with Better Place, but um, even though Better Place made a deal just recently in China, uh, but according to the Better Place people, the Chinese are not only serious about going electric, uh, but they're going on the model of Better Place, meaning with cars that have batteries that you can swap out. So that if you need to go beyond the range of the battery, you pull into a swap station and the battery is changed for you. Uh, automatically, you don't have to get out of the car, it's part of your subscription in about one minute, and you drive off with a full battery. That's the key to the system. Um, uh, so I think that this is a very exciting model that I hope Israel does in many different areas, in education, in health, and in other things, where you take a global problem, you solve it in a small country as a kind of a demonstration site, what Shai Agassi, the founder of Better Place, calls a beta country. He's treating Israel as a beta country. Um, you solve the problem in a small place in a way that other countries can, can implement. Uh, and I think this is an exciting model even for larger countries where you, you decide you're going to tackle a global problem uh, in a way that you'll be the first and so you'll have your first, uh, your early adopter benefits but you also essentially create a, a market or, or a, a great new industry to the whole world. So I'll just leave it. I've been talking a lot. And uh, open, <laughs> open your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've been to living in the U.S. for a long time? I was until 1994. Okay. Do you think it's easier for beginners <coughs> to start a startup here or in the U.S.? I mean, here we've been visiting incubators and they have helps and the deaf man has a very high level of education and well for a lot of things I mean not only for money but also for finding brains to work with you and everything. Is it easier here? Yeah well the United States is probably the other country where where the main other country where there's a really big established culture of startups in obviously in Silicon Valley but even in but now in other places in the United States, like New York, Boston, Colorado, there are a bunch of other kind of uh, centers uh, of startups. And uh, so in general, it's, it's not easy to do startups anywhere. It's just very hard to do no matter 
uh, where you are. Um, but it's, it's relatively easier in, in Israel and the United States because there's a culture that, uh, that accepts it, that supports it. Uh, there's also, um, it's important to have a legal environment that's friendly. In other words, it has to be easy to go bankrupt. Uh, because uh, if, it's, if, you know, if you're putting your, your whole life at stake uh, by doing a startup, you're probably not going to do it. Uh, you, you have to be able to fail. Um, and that's critical.